Hey everybody, my name is Cody Pondsmith. I'm general manager at Artel Soaring Games and lead designer on the Witcher TRPG. And I'm Mike Pondsmith. I'm the head of Artel Soaring Games, and I'm the guy who killed your cyberpunk character. We're here to do a little show we like to call Listen Up, where we uh, take fan questions and That's try to answer them as succinctly as we possibly can. Or at least sort of legibly. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So without uh, any further ado, let's jump in. Okay. So I think I'll start us off here. All right, go. Um, Vincent asks, never Vincent. having played Cyberpunk 2020. I What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> really? You're, you're dropping the Vincent, ball. Vincent, come on, pick it up. <laughs> I was wondering if the world had its share of conspiracy theorists, whispers of the Illuminati, and maybe even people claiming to have been abducted by aliens, if they exist in this world. Uh, so, whispers, good question, Vincent. Okay, good question, Vincent. Uh, whispers of conspiracy? Come on. The entire cyberpunk world is basically about conspiracies and evil stuff. I and mean, admittedly, you do have, it is a world where, you know, the corporations really are putting fluoride in the water and, you know, brainwashing your children or whatever. Exactly. And they have gigantic camps, you know, where they're building aliens. Um, building are, aliens. They're building aliens, man. At any rate, to get on with it, yeah, there are a lot of conspiracies. There are no general overwatching conspiracies except for the one which concerns the cyber generation kids. And we don't get into that too deeply because um, part of it is we set it up so that you would have the fun of figuring it out yourselves as to what was going on. Well, it's also one of those the fractured timeline sort of situations. Yeah, exactly. It, it happens sort of a little bit in the core cyberpunk background. Might be worth mentioning that for our, uh, our okay, adoring cyber fans. Hi, guys. <laughs> Okay, the adoring fans. Oh, God, I can't believe you said that. I can't either. Yeah, okay. Uh, here's the deal. Cyber Generation was an offshoot story that I did a while back. Uh, it is similar to in Japan where a major uh, anime line, like Gundam, for example, have a side story. Cyber Generation is a side story about kids who get infected by a nanoplague and end up basically getting cybernetic-based abilities. Uh, it is a side story. And it basically does occur within the cyberpunk world, but it then takes its own little offshoot. Yeah. And, of course, the events of Cyber Generation all stem from, uh, was it Operation Fox? Fo Fox yeah, Fox. no, Fox 64. Fox 64. Okay. Um, which happens differently based on the two different uh, dimensions of the setting. In one situation, uh, it's, it's effectively covered up and everything is... Actually, is it's covered up in both. Okay, but unfortunately, unfortunately, the play gets out a lot further in the Cyber Generation timeline. And in the Cyberpunk mainline timeline, they pretty much found everybody who got the play and killed them. So oh, that could be your that's first good, good conspiracy. You know? Cy Cybergen's a really fun game, actually. Yeah, I but do. I think we digressed. Yeah, Victor, just yes. digressed enough. Victor, there are all kinds of conspiracies. Uh, but for the main line, it's whatever's currently going on with the corporation in your local area, which means they could be putting stuff in the water. They could be using chemtrails to control you. Any one of those is a possibility. And we'll leave that open to the GM because it's very fun to play with. So, can I get one? Yeah. All ahead. right. What do we got? Okay. Adam Wigley asks, hello, Artel Sorian. This may seem an odd request, but I was hoping for a little bit of information on the nation of Zangabar in The Witcher. I find the African aspect of it fascinating. I was hoping to make a character be from there. However, my GM won't allow it as there is minimal information on the nation. Any information on the nation that could be provided would be incredibly helpful. Even just a stat bonus. So Zangabar is, is a weird one. Um, it's it's in the league of of countries referenced as beyond the continent, um, like Wakanda. Yeah, actually closer closer than you would think because uh -oh. much like um, you know a lot of countries that are mentioned like Zarkania and Ophir and whatnot, there there are a lot of sort of uh, East African or de you know definitely as he mentioned African ties. Um, you know the fact that Zangvabar is probably more or less Zanzibar. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of information missing about it, but um, 
that's kind of hard to say because it has been left mysterious for a reason, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just to kind of so that you have those mysteries outside of the boundaries. Well, I assume sooner or later you'll try to fill a little bit of Zangbabar. I'd right? love to. I'd absolutely love to to touch on Z- uh, Zangbabar and Ophir and all of the outside nations. For the time being, I can't say anything. Adam, I can't say anything canon. Um, mom's the word here. Yeah, mom's the word. I never said this. Um, but, you know, seeing what we have seen about Zangvabar, um, you know, it is obviously a very powerful trading nation. Uh, we have seen uh, we have seen sort of emissaries and whatnot from Zangvabar doing trade with various northern uh, merchants. Um if it's anything like Ophir, they probably have a fairly flourishing society um, with, you know, if it's like Ophir, great architecture and things like that. I might place it perhaps more on like give you a stat bonus to, to business. Uh, you might go down sort of the same similar sort of like Great Plains and give them like perhaps a, a stat bonus to I wouldn't do writing because I'd probably do writing as a stat bonus for Ophir because mm-hmm. they have a very potent sort of riding culture with their giant horse god in the sky um, giant but yeah horse god in the sky. I god I want to touch on the horse god in the sky for Ophir but Wait, you um, didn't say that did you <laughs> hey don't judge um, anyway so I I'd give you know perhaps a, a bonus to business perhaps a bonus to endurance to deal with sort of, um, you know, more uh, harsh weather climates or something like that. Um, but it's hard to hard, hard to say anything particularly solid because we haven't really worked out with CD um, and Sevkovsky hasn't mentioned anything about it. So hopefully that at least solves some of your questions. Got one for me? At least attempt. Andrew Maythaler, I'm going to... Probably, I probably butchered that. I'm very sorry. Asks, given that the level of detail CDPR claims that Mike keeps about even the most minor background characters. Oh, they have little faith. I was wondering if there's a similar level of unused detail around the background events in Cyberpunk, specifically the Central American Wars. Are there any interesting battles, events, characters, or turning points in either war that the average player wouldn't know? I'm, that I'm the curious. average player wouldn't know uh, yeah. because we haven't talked about it, or because because it, we haven't talked about it. Okay, I, I'm actually uh, curious. South Am Wars. Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious about this one because okay. the South Am Wars, I feel like, are a big part of Cyberpunk that a lot of people don't think about. Interestingly enough, we're going to be talking quite a bit more about the South Am Wars, and I am currently in a long, long discussion with w- one of my counterparts over at CDPR as we actually flex. Fleshed him out a bit more. Oh, yes. He comes back muttering at the night. Yeah. Like, what did he mean by that? And meanwhile, I like to think Patrick's walking and going, what did he mean by that? Any rate, South Am Wars began basically because um, towards the tail end of the 90s uh, in the cyberpunk cosmology, the government of the United States had a lot of problems going up against um, Rampant lack of food, ecological collapse, several plagues, a nuclear accident, you name it, they probably had it. Uh-huh. And of course, if you really want to keep your population control, you got to give them something else to do. So they decided they'd fight a drug war in South America. Because that always works. That always works. Uh, at least they didn't pick Vietnam. Uh, now, so- I'm, I'm curious real quick cartels in cyberpunk pretty nasty i imagine extremely nasty and the cartels did not go down easily and uh, this was exacerbated by the fact that there were certain other countries out there who mm-hmm. wanted to support those cartels to believe the united states so it was a real tit for tat mm-hmm. and it also gave several of the factions in what was called the gang of four which were the alphabet organizations fbi dea nsa cia and so forth who were by that point de facto running the government. Mm-hmm. Yes, we actually have a deep state in cyberpunk. And um, those guys who were de facto running the government also wanted to try out all their new cyberware and all this cool stuff they've been doing. So they sent people down there, cybered up, ready to fight as first commando groups and then later actual military task groups. The bad news is that a lot of the cyberware was being produced outside of the States, was being produced by Euro companies and so forth. And it ended up also in the hands of the narco terrorists. Uh, supplying both sides of the war. You got it. It's kind of like Anaheim Electronics and Gunham. Okay. So basically, that's a long story. I'll 
fill you in on one day. No, there's there's some gun fans out there. Hey, gun fans. <laughs> so basically, what happened was two factions, one of which was more of a guerrilla war, one of which was a covert war, but wasn't really a covert war. Sort of a Cold War situation. Right. Threw more and more resources in. And it finally got ugly when the narco terrorists uh, started doing things like hitting the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, They blew up several large buildings. They attacked a few fronts uh, in New York and D.C. Um, There was a major battle in Santiago, Chile Mm -hmm. that pretty much wiped out most of the city. There were also battles to the Amazon. There were battles along the Rio Grande as the people went back and forth. The war had this way of popping up like a forest fire that could ignite in any place where it looked like the opposite side was a little bit weak, where they weren't guarding a border, where they didn't have cyber troops. And this went on for a long time, died down during the first collapse. And then during the second rise and collapse, It got really heated up. And at that point, we were seeing the advent of things like AB4s. We were seeing concerted military strike teams. Because by this point, the guys in the southern half of the battle had been so successful at nailing the Gang of Four that the Gang of Four now couldn't let it rest. They had to solve So this is when tanks started coming in. Tanks started coming in, crossing the border. Artillery strikes and things like that. Most of the South Am War actually takes place in Central America and uh, Northern South America, Mm -hmm. if that's possible. And basically, it goes on as a covert war for a while and then goes on and on. Eventually, what happens is the Gang of Four collapses the United States goes into a total hole mm-hmm. and all of those guys who had been cybered up and left to fight that war yeah. suddenly found there wasn't even a nation to back that war anymore. So they had to walk all the way back oh, like boy. Xenophon of the 300. Assumedly taking fire from taking fire yeah. from all sides. So they had to fight their way out. Johnny Silverhand, for example, was a young raw recruit mm. who ended up, you know, coming through that war and it changed him forever. And of course, they're all crazy cybered up. All insanely cybered crazy up. Crazy cybered up, traumatized by war and abandoned by their nation. And then coming back to a nation which at that point was just barely holding on. Things in Cyberpunk universe are really screwed up, let so me tell you. remember this if your character's a South Am vet. Yeah, you probably wake up in flashbacks. If you want to get a better sense of the South Am war... Uh, we did a book called Forlorn Hope. Uh, it is a anthology adventure, and it concerns veterans of the South Am War. And it gives you a pretty good idea of what they lived through and what they're still living through as a result of it. So hopefully that answers some of the questions about the South Am. Okay, so let me see. I got something here. Let's see what we got. Uh, yes. Jason Rand asks. Oh, Jason Rand. Hey, Jason. Uh, hey, Jason. I'm going to I'm gonna actually meet you in person someday. Jason, word up. Uh, in the Witcher TRPG, where's the will, war? Sorry. In the Witcher TRPG, where's the war with Nilfgaard happening at this time? Has Vizima fallen yet? The map indicates... Well, I can't talk today. The map indicates it, it has, I think. But the description of Temeria says it's still under siege. Um... The setting of the war is kind of interesting because it happens, from what we see, it happens in two fronts. Um, and, and now reporting on the war in Tamaria. Uh, yes. Um, we we decided to put it really early so that everybody could have the excitement of the war in various places. So uh, The excitement of war. Yes. The rundown is basically um, west to east is in the far, in the far western front. Nilfgaard basically... Storms through uh, Verdun, leaves the Brokolon forest alone because it's full of dryads who kill anything who walk into the forest. And Nilfgaard doesn't appear to care about going to war with, like, purely non-human countries, usually because the non-human countries don't seem to care. Um, So they don't go to war with Nilfgaard. Um, And right now, that battle is at the Pirate City of Carrick, which is... That sounds awesome. Yeah, the Pirate City of Carrick. Can I be your Witcher game? Oh, maybe. Um... The Pirate City of Carrick is this uh, city on a sandbar, uh, which was founded by a, a pirate whose name I can't for the life of me remember right now. But it's part of Sidorus, sort of. And so they're fighting there, fighting this island, this sandbar island full of pirates and the Sidoran Navy 
and the Skelligers coming in from from the West. This sounds awesome. It is. It's super cool. Wow. Um, um, I'm going to jump aside because I want to leave Tamaria for last. Okay. Um, the Eastern Front, which is apparently the worst part of the conflict, um, is basically where uh, Edern has gone down. Uh, Leary and Rivia have gone down. Um, Maeve is Maeve is now basically sort of leading a a counter offensive sort of guerrilla group mm-hmm. in uh, Lyria, as far as we're concerned. Kind of, kind of looking at that, um, and they're currently basically they've stormed through Edern, which is just on fire right now. Edern on fire, um, and they are about to basically lay siege to the the Pontar Valley which may or may not be controlled by Saskia and her band of, of um, you know, ragtag freedom fighters. Uh, by the way, so, we like to fill in here. Saskia is a dragon. Yes. Spoilers. Saskia is a dragon who, depending on your gameplay in Witcher 2 or what you decide for the final outcome of those games, may or may not be under the control of sorceresses. And at this point in the, in the timeline has just sort of flown off. So things are not going to go super good in Vergen for the for the people of Vergen or Kedwen if they won the siege. Um, and then Tamaria is... And now Tamaria. Tamaria is in an especially rough situation because uh, Nilfgaard has sieged up through Sodden and Bruges and, you know, the lower parts of Tamaria. And they are like... They are I about to hit Vizima. And um, Vizima's going down. We decided to let players be part of the siege of Vizima because it's kind of a really big thing. But um, we have descriptions from Vernon Roach, uh, Ultimate Terrain Commando, that the siege of Vizima lasts like a day. <laughs> like some siege. Come on. Like the Nilfgaardians get there and the Temerians fight valiantly for like a day, and then they're just Peace absolutely out. destroyed. So. <laughs> You can play in the first hours of the Siege of Azima, <laughs> and that can be the opening of your campaign as your players are summarily crushed by the war machine of Nilfgaard and have to escape. Or you could play different, and your players could somehow manage to, to hold out against the Nilfgaardians, but that's kind of where the war is at the moment. It's, it's not going well for our heroes. It's especially rough because in the north, um, the Winter War has just started as Kedwin goes hey uh redania we need some help because nilfgaard is coming we only be we've only ever been able to defeat nilfgaard in the past because we band together and and fight them off as as a team and radovid and redania basically says yeah sounds good we need to consolidate the north by the way i'm gonna invade your country now so you actually cannot really escape war Unless you either go deep south into Nilfgaard or you go north into Kovir and Povis, which is currently not at war with anyone, I think. Because nobody wants to go to Kovir and Povis. No, they're just really, they're neutral and they're rich and they, they're they basically the, the, the Switzerland of the Northern Kingdoms. Okay. So you got one for me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So this will be an interesting one. Um... Okay, I'm scared now. Marcel Raba asks... Hi, Marcel. Hey, Marcel. I'm interested in this one. What is in Africa, India, and Central Asia in Cyberpunk 2020? Okay. Africa, Central Asia, and India. Yeah. Okay. Uh, This can get a bit complex. Most of the big, ugly action in the Cyberpunk world was taking place in South Ham and in Europe. Then there was a subcategory... That went down, and basically that happened in the Fourth Corporate War, Mm -hmm. where a big chunk of Southeast Asia got wiped out because that was a fighting zone. Yeah, I know Sov Oil and Petrochem throw down in in most of Southeast Asia. Right, and part of it is beyond the fact that there's a lot of oil there. People (laughs) using less oil because obviously chew too, but oil is still critical for most of the... uh, plastics, chemicals, background stuff of a technological society. Yeah. So they're still fighting over all. The other problem they have is that those areas are major trade routes. Yeah. Uh, if you block off several of those straits, you <clears throat> literally bring trade to a halt. And that's actually going to be a big part of what starts situations off in Cyberpunk Red. 
mm-hmm. is what happened when the fourth corporate war basically shut off all of those access points. Yeah. It's not good. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So India is one of those areas that's an access point. Luckily, at this point, India is relatively advanced in terms of its own internal technology. So they're able to dodge a lot of the problems that the corporations bring. In addition, they have their own corporations. So by the time you reach the middle 2020s, India has not isolated itself, Mm -hmm. but made it much, much harder for some of the other nations to get in and fight their corporate wars. You're more likely to go over the border and have an Arasaka versus Militech fight and find the Indian government sends out its troops and throws you both out. And since you're not as big as you know a major nation, they can still do that. Yeah. So India right now... Kind of isolation. Yes, it's basically pretty isolationist. Because of that, they did not get hit quite as badly during some of the South, uh, sort of the uh, Southeast Asia battles. Okay. So let's see, where else are we going to Southeast, destroy? Okay. Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, as I Wait. touched on before. Central Asia. Central Asia. Sorry about Central that. Asia. Um, the Central Asian plateau is interesting because in 2020's universe, uh, China is still relatively isolated and much like it is today, a weird fusion of communism meets. Um, let's call it state-run capitalism. Mm-hmm. So, consequently, well, how, does, how does that how does that factor? Uh, how does that factor? Once again, is they're not quite as isolationist because they need to be able to sell product, mm-hmm. and the people they sell product to the most were the United States. Uh, also, they're in the middle of keeping the Korean Peninsula calm. Okay, because at this point, without balance, the Korean Peninsula is becoming kind of a hotbed of potential. Ugly nuclear holocaust and other things. Okay. Okay. So (laughs) China gets blown back during the fourth corporate war because during one of these battles, um, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly who because that's coming up in red, but a a bio plague is released on Hong Kong. And Hong Kong pretty much dies. Everybody there dies. They don't know how the plague is exactly spread, mm-hmm. although they think it's an aerosol. Okay. It's one of the conspiracy theories. Um, yeah. They don't exactly know how, but the Chinese essentially realize if this gets out in the main population, we're going to have a ridiculous number of people dying in horrible ways. So, okay. So what happens is they literally seal the border and the mountains backing Hong Kong and don't let anybody out and let them all die. Okay. Okay. And by the time we reach the cyberpunk red period, there is now a huge wall that blocks people from crossing that area and a dead zone of about 50 miles with drones, uh, bots, you name it, to make sure nobody ever brings that plague out. Um, It is so absolute, however, that people died essentially at their posts, which means computers, power systems, uh-huh. uh, banking systems, all those things are still running in oh. Hong Kong. And as a result, during the war, Alt Cunningham and a number of the um, self-aware AIs basically flee into what's left of Hong Kong, take residence up in the systems, and begin what is called the ghost war. No. Yeah. And the ghost world is essentially where the AIs are holding out. And they're making sure nobody else comes into their part of Hong Kong. So it hasn't been a really long time. Mm-hmm. Have Has the city collapsed at all without maintenance? Or is it just like a perfectly still... It is a perfectly still spooky uh, place. I once said Full a, of corpses. <laughs> uh, well, by now, most of the corpses have, have you know rotted away. Full of bones. <laughs> full of bone, you know, in their clothes, scraps. Um, this was a pretty complete bioplague. Mm-hmm. The rats died. Ooh. It was bad. Everything died. Yeah, it basically went after anything mammalian. So the lizards are having a great time. Hong Kong but, is dead but full of lizards. However, when you have when you do have a whole lot of AIs mm-hmm. and you still have most of the infrastructure there, most of the street cleaning is still automated. Most of the pickup is still automated. Oh, that's really creepy. So <laughs> you I and I once sent a party in there. Uh-huh. Uh, when I was testing out some of the ideas here, I sent a party into Hong Kong wearing massive hazmat suits. Uh-huh. They look like NASA astronauts landing on the moon. And it's dead silent there, except for the occasional distant chirping of a lizard, not even a bird. Things fly over, 
And if the AIs don't give them, then the laser systems that bird. the Chinese have put. Bird flies over, turret pops up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it is a dead silent, dead city, except that every so often you'll hear, oh, a speaker suddenly activate and a string of code will come out or a warning voice in a very flat AI voice will come out. Or, because it's really creepy and I like it, uh, occasionally the AIs and all and some of the people who've been ghosted by Soul Killer will actually speak in the clear, which means that they're actually using phones or vid boards or whatever to communicate okay. with each other. Okay. So you'll be walking along in your enormous hazmat suit, hoping that your oxygen holds out, and suddenly a vid board will come on and a kind of pale looking face that's made up of scan lines appears and has a conversation with somebody you can't see and tweeting noises as various uh, binary code systems activate. Um, the street sweeper activates and moves past you and sweeps the bones. It's a creepy place. Nice. Okay. 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 Uh, we're, we're super jumping off. To- we are. We've given yeah. a million people ideas for their games. Right but- now, people are fiercely writing this down, and then they're going to hold me accountable. Um, Central Asia, Asia, Central well, Asia. There's not a lot happening there. Uh, some of the open warfare happened in that area, mm-hmm. but again, the Chinese government is a government. And one of the important things to remember about the fourth corporate war is that it takes place mostly in places like the United States where the government is severely weakened. Yeah. Where the governments are strong, they can muster militaries Yeah. and the militaries are very, very low to let corporations fight on their turf. Cyber Mongolian Steppe Warriors, yes or no? Hmm. I mean, that's a great supplement idea, but... I'm on it. I'm on it. Um, so next week, expect Cyber Mongolian Steppe Warriors here on our But story. seriously, I'm curious. That That's a lot. That's a large area of land. Anything going on? Not really. Uh, okay, so it's mostly China in that It's area. mostly China. Okay, last one, mm-hmm. Africa. Africa. That's a lot of that's a lot of territory. Oh, Africa! Yeah, it's actually my fave. Africa, interestingly enough, um, doesn't get hit very hard. Okay, and the reason is that way back in the late twenty teens, mm-hmm. uh, the ESA, European Space Agency, began the Kilimanjaro Mass Driver Project, followed by a rather large orbital elevator that they're working on, the Beanstalk. So. A lot of the fighting ended because suddenly all of these African nations and tribal groups had a employer who had high technology, was hiring like crazy, was teaching brand new skills Mm -hmm. and getting people to build this mass driver or elevator. So they were not about to let somebody fight a war over a quadrillion trillion dollar project that was going to get them orbital freedom. So consequently, what has happened is Africa has this weird thing of fairly advanced spots, particularly around the mass driver, areas that are less advanced but are recovering, Mm -hmm. and a really powerful space-linked culture. Many of the guys up in the orbitals, Mm -hmm. many of the people who are doing the heavy space stuff, come out of the various African nations. They get training. They get interested. There's money involved. There's you know mass campaigns to wipe out things like you know various diseases and so forth, so that the workforce will be able to actually get up there and get, get that mass driver built. Yeah. So Africa is actually at this point moving forward rather rapidly because if there's one thing that can bring people together over tribalism, it's money. Well, and also they haven't had the same sort of knockdown to ground level that a lot of the rest of the sort of world, world has them had. Has. Yeah. And I imagine the the tech probably filters out it farther and farther from yes. the uh, the main area. You, yeah, you can't you can't, for example, have somebody using the equivalent of a tricorder uh, making adjustments on a mass driver and then expect he doesn't take it home with him at night. Yeah, and he certainly takes the knowledge. Yeah, and one of the beautiful things about cyberpunk is, <laughs> as a concept, technology is ubiquitous, and the question becomes who gets to use it. In Africa, everybody ends up using it. So Africa is actually a rather startling change from anywhere else in the world. Hmm. They are the primary space-born culture right now. And we talk about that in near-orbit and deep space quite a bit. Nice, nice. 
It'd be really that, interesting to set a set a campaign in that sort of situation. Near orbit has campaigns that are set up along that baseline. So interesting, interesting. You now have a bit idea of what's happening around the rest of the world. Okay, and I again, hope that helped. Yeah, I I think we should give you some baselines for it. And like I said, we have several books out, like Near Orbit, Deep Space, and um, you know various background materials we're doing. We're constantly doing new material as well, and many of these things will get answered when we step into the post fourth corporate war period, which will be covered in what we now call as a working title, Cyberpunk Red. So hopefully it helps you out. Hope that helps Marcel. And uh, that's going to be it for For uh, our first episode of listen up. So Uh, signing off, signing off Cody Pondsmith and Mike Pondsmith. Have a good day guys. Aloha. This has been listen up. Your hosts were Mike and Cody Pondsmith. Production work was done by Tara Jones and Jay Gray. This video and the games and characters mentioned in it are copyright R. Telsorian Games. Thanks for watching, and remember, keep your sword sharp and stay safe on the streets. Greetings, fellow runners.